And from an art department perspective, I would never have known that every single piece of dressing and every single prop is intentionally thought about and placed exactly by a set dresser or the set decorator. My biggest, I didn't know I didn't know moment, trademark. It's a hamster in at least one shot, but he's mm. trying to hide it. So yeah, you know, you're gonna hunt for it. But, but I guess even that, that is intentional. And welcome everyone. This week we've got something a little bit different. We are actually expanding beyond our own mm. little department, beyond our own little deranged little sandbox. <laughs> we are making friends into the we art are. department. Yay! Our and friends. not only that, we are actually checking in on a film studio graduate, so mm. to speak, in the wild. Yeah. So this week oh, wow. we have uh, Lachlan oh, Anderson. Hello, hello. Hello, Thank Lachlan. You for having me on. So tell us a little bit, Lachlan. Uh, where are you at at the moment in your filmmaking career, and how did you get here? Tell us your whole life story. Everything. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> how about we backtrack to about a month ago, and then we'll start there. So You're only a I... month old. Wow. Yeah, I know. Crazy. So I am an art department focused filmmaker. So I've been only in the industry for about, God, uh, let's call it seven months now, just over half a year. So I've done two real world jobs now. And that was straight after film school, which I went to JMC Ooh. with Kim, Kim Sargedius. And what led you to, to filmmaking in the first place? Yeah. So filmmaking was always a sort of medium I wanted to try in high school in particular. Mm -hmm. So I have always considered myself a very visual arts kind of focused person, which I also, I did a lot of, a lot of drawing and painting and the traditional kind of art stuff in high school. And then I uh, did notice that in it, my classes. Yeah. Yeah. I did like to doodle away when things got too <laughs> brain explodey. So, you know, <laughs> but yeah, so of that in my school, classes. Yes. Lots of lots yes. of drawings in your book. A lot of drawings. And you know what? That's fine. I enjoyed fine. Yeah. drawing and exploding my mind. So <laughs> yes. So in high school, that's where I really started to get into the filmmaking kind of things when it was kind of mandatory for us to take those classes on film literature, so to speak, mm -hmm. and analyzing film and that sort of thing. And then once you get a band of classmates together to actually create something, that's when Mm. I found that it was really fun. So that's that's what led me to decide the film school path. After high school, I chose to go to James the Academy and study there. Mm. Mm. And at that point, when you started at uh, James C, so just for the audience there, we do a one-year diploma or we do a two-year bachelor's degree. So Lachlan did the two-year bachelor's course. When you first entered uh, James C, Lachlan, did you have an idea of where you wanted to specialize in the industry? Uh, I had no clue, to be honest. Uh, mm. I had done stuff. done a little bit of writing before. I had done I'd done audio stuff before. I made like audio dramas in high school and that sort of thing. I was not even looking at production design whatsoever. That was just something that fell into my hands at one point. So yeah, no, I had no clue. I, I came into it with a complete open mind. The what, only what, thing I knew was that everything was new. So, yeah. What drew you to production design? When, when did you go like, ah, wonderful. I want to make this room yeah, look nice. Yeah, yes. That would probably be when we took an elective at JMC. So there's mm. an elective called Designing for the Screen. It's the only production design class during the course, but it was enough to sell me the idea of production design in general. So... There you go. Yeah, so that was, I want to say, halfway through the degree, so about a year in. That was my introduction to production design. I'd like to to extend that a little bit then. So I guess this is, uh, I'm opening this for both Lachlan and Ethan, and I'd like to see you compare backgrounds and... And, and the comments. With and that. the people yeah. in the comments. Absolutely, as well. Um, <laughs> What was the most surprising thing about film school? Film school, I, I this is kind of a little bit of a broader filmmaking thing, but mm -hmm. this is what I discovered when I was in film school. So 
I did not realize how much of filmmaking and the medium in general is curated, how much filmmakers are really intentionally creating the images that we see. Mm. Mm -hmm. Even to the point, I think you talked on it in the last week's episode about guiding the viewer's hand through the frame and that sort of Mm -hmm. idea Mm -hmm. about composition. And I didn't realize how much everyone's job is to actually make sure what is being seen is exactly what they want in the frame. Mm -hmm. And from an art department perspective, I would never have known that every single piece of dressing and every single prop is intentionally thought about and placed exactly by a set dresser or the set decorator thought about it a month or two ago. And just Mm. that crazy level of detail. Unless you're um, Terry Gilliam and you have an obsession with hamsters. (laughs) I'm not familiar with that one, but... That sounds uh, yeah, interesting. The, the story goes, <laughs> apparently Terry Gilliam has an obsession with putting hamsters in his films, <laughs> at least in one shot. Oh, man. The more I hear about that guy. <laughs> it's an yeah. Easter egg. You know that in a Terry Gilliam movie, there is a hamster. It's a hamster in at least one shot, but he's mm. trying to hide it. So, yeah, you're going to hunt for it. But, but I guess even that, that it, is intentional. So yeah, I was just going to say even the hamster. Yeah. It, yeah, even the hamster. I think uh, so, um, yeah, I think that was my big thing. Like I, I still think there's like you do get shocked by how little is incidental because when mm-hmm. you look at it, even if you're like really without any prior knowledge, if you if you're really like tearing like tearing a frame apart, you can still think okay, there's a camera, there's some lights, and there's a location in a suit. Or something like, like you know, there's a there's. It doesn't feel as as like planned out as it looks. It, it, it still kind of looks incidental, and it's still something that I kind of struggle with today because I feel like this can't possibly have been planned out this intricately. But then the second you the second you begin to learn about how it works, it's just like this overwhelming amount of thinking is being put into like one. It's probably learning that every shot has the same amount of coordination as a composed photo or a painting or a drawing is probably the the part that really gets you that kind of blows your mind a little bit because you're like wow 50 to 300 shots in each of these movies this is bonkers the fact that they've planned all of these out extending on that when do you think you made the realization that all those names in the credits aren't just there to extend the credits so you can put cool music over it as in yeah i i would say that's after film school when i yeah. actually <laughs> got a job in the industry can we can we sidetrack a little bit on on the two jobs you've had what's the general kind of size and scope of production if you were to estimate uh, a number of crew across all departments i would say for for the first one that i was on it was a series so mm-hmm. it was an episodic series and i would i would estimate about 200 and 200 or so maybe yep. a little bit mm-hmm. more yeah, in the art department alone, it would have been I want to say 15, 15 people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then extending that art department because that's just that's just your production designer, art directors, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Extending beyond that, there's also the whole construction crew because yep. there was a yep. set mm-hmm. build. Mm-hmm. That's your yep. scenic painters. That's all of those sorts of people as well. So that just adds to that number as well, and it's. Crazy, because all of those people have a credit and all of those people have a different job. So, you know, that's when I realized the scale of things. <laughs> Finally. Asking asking for a friend, how did you get those jobs? What was the... What was the uh, how did I get those jobs? What was the... So, what was the did you just go on a... Did you do the... The fabled, oh, I just volunteered on a bunch of sets until someone grabbed me up, or was it like a LinkedIn moment or something? Like, what was the what was the the process? It right. sounded like it was, well, it was short shortly after film school. So yeah, pretty, so the, pretty unheard of. <laughs> tried tried and true, Lachlan Anderson method is going onto Google and looking up as many people who work in Sydney in the film and TV industry as possible. (laughs) Ah. Scouring those people and narrowing it down to who has their email online to the public (laughs) and then emailing those people and saying, hi, I'm recently graduating film school. Can I have Mm. a job, please? So that is the best way that I have found to get your foot, your little toe in the door. (laughs) Um, And I said, I said, look, I, I actually... 
I did it when I was still at JMC. So I mm. said, look, I'm studying a degree. I'd love to do an internship on a production before I get into the industry. I would love some experience. And you, you do that 12 different times to 12 different people. And you'll get one person who says, look, I don't have anything, but here's another person. And then that person will send you off to another person. And then that person to another person. And by that time that you've made it through five different people, someone will know a production that is happening in Sydney that needs someone to paint a wall for 10 hours a day, something like that. Yeah. And then from there, if you're a hard worker and they like the way that you paint that wall, they'll get you back for another day. So there you go. Yeah, that's my method. That's going to be clip, you know. Yeah, I like the way you paint that wall. I like the way you paint that wall. I painted a lot of walls. I think that is also a good segue into something else. I wanted to ask, what's been the diff biggest differences between film school and industry? Yeah, I actually, first and foremost, I'd love to talk about what I found very similar because... It was what I learned in your class, Kim, which prepared me hey. for the industry. So it was very useful. Just um, for your information, this is not a paid presentation, okay? We haven't not, bribed not him. Not paid, no. not paid. Funnily enough, it wasn't anything to do with cinematography per se. It was more of how to, I suppose, collect yourself on a film set and present yourself. Yeah, Kim's class, the lessons that I learned in there were actually kind of essential going in. Um, was it be it afraid? Wasn't... I'm assuming it was just be afraid, right? Oh, that's just, that's just <laughs> be the <fearful>. instinct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly, it wasn't anything to do with cinematography in itself. It was more so the way that you present yourself on set. That was really important because if you're transitioning from film school, having never been on a professional set and you go onto set, you have no idea what you're doing. All I could remember was Kim, Kim's words in my head. Don't plug anything in without being, without asking someone first, Hey, that bottle of water that you've got, not in my classroom. Okay. I won't bring that onto set either. Hey, is that mobile phone off during the take? If it's not, you're going to get slabbed. And guess what? Plenty <laughs> of people got slabbed during my production on a professional set as well. So you know what? Oh, so, I so interesting. I think the, yes. the nomen nomenclature has changed then. Ah, getting slabbed, so actually, right. Yeah. As in a slab yeah. of beer, like 24 yeah. beers or 30 beers. Am I right in saying that? It's Lockwood, not just that's... beers, it's slabbed. Yes. A slab. Okay, because okay. that's the thing. I, I thought you said slab of, as in a case. Okay. Yeah, it that's is a case. Thinking. Yeah, yeah no, like, that's that's hundred percent true. A case. Of that's, that's the first time I think Kim's ever been forgiving. Is that you'd only ask us for a beer? And I remember the first time you mentioned that you were like, but in the actual industry, it's a slab. Yeah. It's a case. If you <laughs> something up, that's horrifying. I'm getting slabbed. Those sorts of really fundamental things that are important to a professional set that you wouldn't learn otherwise. That's what I found really important transitioning. Part of the reason I'm asking as well is uh, wondering how much of this is a generational thing in terms of how we set up tertiary education versus how most workplaces actually work. My observation has been over the last five to six years, a lot of the emphasis in tertiary education has become on convenience for the students. When you see advertising, particularly online, what's the message it drives at you? Study when you want. Mm. Study only the subjects you want. Mm. Tailor, custom make your own education. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. Yes, yeah, from, from ads that I've seen. Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you come into university film school thinking that this is what that is going to be, how well does that work with the general mindset and approach to industry? Uh, I would I would say that it it doesn't set up the right things. Mm. Uh -huh. I'd say at least for me, you can have as much technical knowledge as you can possibly get or you can have the best best shot film or anything at, at, at film school but at the end of the day when you go into the industry you will be starting as a little cog so mm. i feel like there still should be more preparation 
to becoming the little cog and not mm. just becoming the head honcho. <laughs> I think a lot of the student film environments were like they because we because we were all familiar with one another, with one another and all like kind of on the same level there wasn't much of a like a, a strictness when it came to the set you know like there wasn't an enforced like on those sets i was thinking to myself the whole time i really don't i hope that no one thinks that this is what a set's going to be like when we leave the when we leave and actually enter the industry because it's so comfortable and so familiar there's not enough fear there should be more fear, I think, to myself. I always go, there should be, I, I should be more afraid, you know? And that's kind of where <laughs> um, I'm going to be asking a bit, like, because that's starting to feel like it would be anathema to the approaches to tertiary education currently. So much of the focus on the student experience seems to be about taking away any feelings of inadequacy. I have a feeling that a lot of the time that sort of thing is definitely the definitely a mindset thing. I feel as though when you're doing an assessment, you have to be wanting to get something out of it and not mm -hmm. just completing it for the sake mm. of yeah. completing mm. a course. For mm. for example, in it would have been oh, 2020 lockdown, one of the lockdowns, oh, yes. I don't remember which one. <laughs> A lot of assessments obviously had to be changed because we were at home. And mm. during that time, I remember Kim because it was Kim's class that was mostly affected because we didn't have equipment. Mm. It was, you are, I'm not going to mark you on, you know, how great of a phone you have to take pictures with. I want you to get something out of this while you're at home. So just try and understand the concepts on a small scale with your phone. And that will be a good enough reason to do the assessment task. And I feel like that's the mindset you have to have when you come into it. You need to be actually getting something out of it and trying to teach yourself and not, don't blame, not blame per se, but don't look for the excuse of, oh, well, I didn't have such and such resource. Therefore I'm being penalized or something like that. We're, we're all doing this degree because we have a love and a passion for making films. So I mm. don't see why you shouldn't make it all about yourself. What is it that mm. you really enjoy in filmmaking and base your entire assignment around that if you can? Let's delve a little bit more into the, the bigger differences between film school and industry. Can you take our viewers through a typical day in the life of an art department cog? Yes, cog. I'd love to. So a typical day for me with what I was doing, I was an art department assistant. So uh -huh. that would mean I do everything under the sun in the art department. So one day I could be, for example, helping with the set construction. So that uh -huh. would be call time, typical call time. Yeah. So it's different for offset and onset hours. So typically mm -hmm. it would be around 8 a.m. call time. For offset? For offset, yeah. So mm -hmm. that would be, for example, when we were constructing the set, it would be 8 a.m. call time. So I would arrive a little bit before 8 a.m. Usually it's around 7.30, quarter to two. Mm -hmm. Once that's over and done with, uh, typically art director will already be there because my mm -hmm. art director was very, what's the, what's the right word? Very enthusiastic and stressed okay. yep. to get everything yep. done. Yeah. So report to the art director and the art director uh -huh. will let me know what needs to be done throughout mm -hmm. the day. So typically it would be priorities getting the set done. So you're going to be with the scenic department today. After that, it's then passed on to either the set decorator or whoever's the head of scenic department, let's, let's say it's the set decorator. So they will say, look, we need to get the front rooms of the house completed because we're shooting in there next week, something like that. Mm -hmm. Your job then for throughout the day is to literally be an art department assistant. It is to make sure you're present for whoever needs a hand. So if it's the scenic people, you need to make sure you're there to give them a hand with painting and Sometimes you'll paint for a few hours. This was an example from a task that I had to do. I had to mm -hmm. start assembling IKEA furniture and 
IKEA barbecues because yep. it was going to be set dressing on another set that was going to shoot tomorrow. So that was the priority now. So it's kind of as an art department assistant, I was jumbling back and forth all over the place. Yep. Because so, stuff needed uh, to be done. You need to be a bit uh nimble and agile minded. Mm. Yes. Nimble, agile minded, definitely. It's one of those things where you do need to be aware that as an assistant, you could be taken to do other jobs at any time. People on set and in production in general will generally recognize when people have have you got a it good set or of, not? have a good set of knowledge, yeah, and mm. skills. Because there are in the art department at least, not to discredit people, but there are people who are there to be extra hands. And there are other people who can recognize that you have a certain set of skills that will be useful. I think we should keep an eye on you and maybe get you on to be a props assistant in the future or a mm. buyer dresser assistant in the future. Because when you're when you're starting low, especially in the art department, you are there to be an extra set of hands, but you can be an extra set of hands and still be aware of everything that's going on around you and ask good questions and people will take notice of that. That is a little tidbit of advice, I guess, when you're starting out if you want to be in the art department pay attention i yeah. think that is, is really goes across all the departments to be honest the way that i did things was kind of making myself more useful was was something that i was trying to do a lot and that that entailed for example you know spending that extra 15 minutes at the end of the day even though it's technically overtime but within a not saying that you should do a lot of unpaid overtime but mm. <laughs> you know just spending that extra time to make sure that you're with your team and helping your team as well mm. making sure you're present and they mm. are recognizing that you're going above and beyond because that's important mm -hmm. you can go above and beyond but if no one's recognizing it but it, it paid off for me not to say that COVID was great but when people got sick you need someone to fill that spot Mm -hmm. And when all the crews in Sydney are off doing another shoot, they're like, oh, crap, we don't have anyone. All right, who have we got? Oh, lucky. You're the assistant. You want to be the standby props for the day? Mm -hmm. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. And know. you've you're given a headset and a radio and you're like, all right. You're on set now. Have fun. It's looking out for those opportunities as well. Sometimes they're terrifying and they were terrifying for me mm. being thrown into the deep end, but mm -hmm. it was so important to just see that side of filmmaking and production because being on set is vastly different to normal offset production days as well mm -hmm. and vastly different from anything you'll see at film school as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that you're picking up on the same things that I've noticed through industry. I think that that stands you in really, really good stead. Can you get things done before someone tells you to do that? Uh -huh. Yeah. And that by sense. extension, can you get them done before anyone else realizes they need doing? It must be very empowering. That, someone goes, hey, can we get? And you're like, no, nope, I've done it. Ex exactly. Done. That's... <laughs> When people go, oh, when people get put on the spot in classes, there is a tendency to rather than take a risk on doing things wrong, take a risk on f***ing up, take a risk on looking like an idiot, they just push back and hide. And if that's your reaction to challenges and opportunities, then you aren't going to be able to step up and take that next step when it's offered. Part of my question here is, am I wrong in this observation that there tends to be a tendency among students to rather than embrace the challenge, rather than take the risk, so to speak, letting it go hide? Am I right or wrong in that observation? You are right. And I can still hear the crickets in classrooms going. Ugh. The question is asked. <laughs> Does anyone want to go and... Oh, my... I think also because there was... The... Because a lot of your okay, this is a lot more nebulous and strange. Because a lot of your classes were conducted in the theaterette, um, 
you know, which for reference is a small theater. So it was like a bunch of seats and then a small stage and then a projector. In a couple of the classes, we'd sit down to hear the theoretical stuff and then we'd get up. And then eventually you transition to just us standing up the whole time, basically to keep us engaged. But when we, when you'd offer us, you know, like come down and do this thing, there's an audience. There's literally an audience in front of us. Like there's a, there's a stage where all the things are happening and there's an audience of fellow students. And it's it, it, it felt like at first what, it felt very th- strange. What do you think it was like being a a, a, a clapper loader when <laughs> oh, you need yeah. to change a mag in the middle of the really heavy dramatic take with the <laughs> lead actor from Gallipoli? <laughs> Oof. God. Okay, so the second part of it is how do we get around that? Because I feel like I'm not doing a good enough job, but I don't know hmm. how to go about it differently. I feel like if everyone did the same thing at the same time, everyone is unwrapping it. Like you get maybe some people in a group, this little group, like three or four people do some cables, three or four people for this light. You know, when you have like a, a few people who are in the same position as you surrounding you, you become less hesitant to look stupid. And because you're being forced into a group, you're actually getting to know each other and get comfortable with one another. But that is kind of how it worked anyway. So mm. I'll have a better solution for you. I'm able to actually think about it. I'm not sure. Lachlan, can I ask you what made you actually take that step up despite the, the scariness of it? In terms of in a professional sense, stepping up, mm-hmm. I would say it's very different to film school because there aren't any repercussions to not stepping up in film school. But in a professional sense, if you don't, that might set you back another, you know. Six months, nine months, a year. Six months (laughs) until the next job where you have the opportunity to step up again. Um, That's the thing. There was also less pressure. Like if you you were afraid to stand up, you didn't have to. Yeah. It's a learning environment. But like I feel like on a set, you'd be like, I need to, because this is my job now. Like, you know, this is what I'm doing. Professionally, if you're asked to step up, it's because they need you. And Mm. if you're not there, things aren't going to run smoothly. Someone's going to have to do their job plus your job. And then you're more of a hindrance. So that psychologically is worse than the anxiety of not doing it. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really, 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 really good point is, you know, that you're not going to get another chance if someone else has to do your job on top of their own. That, that's mm. real. No, no. So I think we've had some good thoughts there about stepping up and the importance of it. However, it doesn't look like we've come up with any earth-shattering solutions for how to actually go about it. So that might be for a future podcast sometime. Mm. I want to wrap up with a couple of things, Lachlan. First off, so far in your filmmaking journey, what's been the biggest you didn't know you didn't know? Trademark, hashtag. Trademarked. Mm. It's your t-shirt. <laughs> t-shirt. What's, what's it's been your biggest way. hashtag you didn't know you didn't know? Trademark, copyright, all rights reserved. Uh, okay, so... No pressure. I think... My biggest, I didn't know, I didn't know moment, trademark, was that I didn't realize how coming into film school, how connected everything is with the art world and culturally filmmaking is Hmm. connected to just wider society in general. That stems back to learning in, Kim, your class about zeitgeists Mm -hmm. and learning about how we tend to follow the zeitgeist of our time mm-hmm. when we are creating our pieces of work. And that was that was probably the biggest I didn't know that I didn't know moment, that there are trends that we follow. Subconsciously, mm-hmm. I would have never made that connection until you actually point it out. Is there something some piece of knowledge or understanding that you've gained now that you're out in the industry, Lachlan, that you wish someone had told you sooner? Oh, I think one of the biggest things for me is that transitioning professionally, there's a lot of anxiety involved in it, especially Mm -hmm. for me. So I, I feel like I wish someone had told me sooner that 
to not get caught up in all the little things that you worry about. So mm -hmm. don't worry about getting this right the first time you do it mm -hmm. because there are people around you a lot more knowledgeable there to help you, to teach you, to tell you that, oh, you're not doing that right. This is actually the way you should do things. And I feel like a lot of the time, the fear of getting things wrong is what is going to inhibit you. Mm -hmm. So just realize that when you're starting off, it really doesn't matter too much. Mm -hmm. I feel, do you feel that there is mistakes. a risk of, of that fear becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy? As in, I, I'm so afraid I, I, that I'm not going to screw up that you don't pay attention to what you're doing and eventually do end up screwing up? You know what I mean? I do think so. I do think that's, so. Th that's very comforting to hear because I think one of the one of the things that's inhibited me a lot from just, like, my plan is pretty similar to, like, what you just said. Send out a whole lot of emails, you know, just... Mm -hmm. every production company and every person you know the anxiety that holds me back from that is i have i have my doubts about their willingness to teach me given that i already have a degree and one of the reasons one of the things i'm going to say is that i'm a finishing i'm finishing off my film degree you know and the you know what the reaction like, is in the industry to that they don't know shit film school graduate <sighs> gonna have to teach them everything that's the thing okay so the I, I I worry about their willingness to teach me because I don't want I don't want them to assume that I'm coming on like thinking that I'm going to know how to do everything. When in actual fact, I wish in every single email I send, I wish I could say, "I'm a little stupid baby who doesn't know anything." You'll have to hold my hand the whole time, please. Thank you. I think I think there's a way to phrase that that will help you. I think go. I think so too. Yeah. Phrasing it, phrasing it as in. <laughs> I think the way to phrase that is saying, I'm a recent film school graduate. Full I'm stop. really passionate about it. I want to get more knowledge. I want to get more mm. experience. Mm. Yeah. I want to do it with you under your guidance because you're the person that I want to get this knowledge from. Mm. Mm. And if you personalize it to these people, I think it's more of a chance that they will eventually go okay yeah why not that's a, another I, I thing think about also, making it... sorry go on i think also your generation have an opportunity that was less prevalent for my generation i would but do some checking up on it's socials. a bit of background research you know what i think that you know like what lachlan was saying like i'd, I'd love to be able to learn from you Mm. I think that in and of itself can come off as a uh, platitude and kind of empty flashy. But mm. if you can back that up with, because in that podcast episode, when you spoke about yada, 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 that really resonated with me. Ah, I like that. Does that make sense? Mm. Because I do think that the people you really want to learn from in today's social media environment will have some kind of platform for publicizing their approach to the art and their approach to learning and coming into the industry in general. Mm. Right, then. Uh, Great advice. This has Wonderful. been uh, uh, an absolute pleasure. I uh, really Excellent. appreciate the time. Lachlan, do you have anything you want to add to our viewers? Uh, I, will, I will leave you with... Uh, don't don't be afraid of that lizard brain. Don't be mm -hmm. afraid to step up because that'll be your next opportunity. Uh, and Excellent. I hear you've got um, opportunities coming up really soon, Lachlan. Go. Oh. Yes. Yes. So, yeah, I'm going to be doing my debut as a props, assistant props buyer dresser on a series. So very excited for that. Um, Excellent. Yes. My first big step up. Wow! Really nice. Excited. Congrats. Wonderful. Let's get thank you an applause sound effect. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That's that's great. Uh, that's really great. I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, and yeah, thanks again for coming along. Uh, we'd love to yeah. catch up again sometime in the future. Well, thank you. I'd Definitely. love to as well. Yes, it's thanks wonderful. For having me. Wonderful chat.